So, you have to treat that as a joint or a node. Let's try to draw the deflected shape. Let's begin with the right side. And you'll probably get a shape like this with a slope at E equal to 0. Now, when you attempt to draw beyond, then you have to maintain compatibility. So, at C, that same angle, in this case, we are assuming a clockwise angle to move, and then we proceed and complete maintaining the same rotation theta B at on the left side and right side. Over. So, this is how you draw the deflected shape. And if you look at the active degrees of freedom at the different joints, you find that you have theta B as an unknown, and theta A you have no movement, you have theta C as an unknown, you have delta D, that's a translation or a sway unknown, and you also have theta D. So, that's it. So, that is how you arrive at the degree of kinematic indeterminacy in a continuous beam. And uh, you may ask the question, but there are many other unknowns. Say in the middle of CD, I don't know the deflection or the slope. Well, the argument is you don't need to know. If your objective is to find just the bending moments, you don't need to know. And if you want to know, you can always find out. How do you find out? So, let's, let's find out how that happens. If you take a typical beam element, a prismatic beam element, AB, and if we argue that all I need to know is the joint displacement at the two ends A and B, which I have shown here as D1, D2, D3, D4, then I can find the deflection and the slope at any intermediate point within that element through simple interpolation. Let us say I do not know anything about structural analysis, but I know mathematics. Then I can write delta as a function of x and I can uh, create a displacement function. Um, let us say it is a polynomial function. So, obviously, I can write a polynomial equation delta of x as a cubic function of x and apply these four boundary conditions and I can solve and get the polynomial uh, solution. And I have got an equation for delta of x. If I differentiate that, I have got theta of x. So, that is that's the basis of finite element analysis. Now, the whole question is, are these good enough? Is the cubic equation the correct equation? Could it be a, a higher order equation? Well, in this method, we are assuming that we are applying loads only at the joints. We will discuss later why that is assumed. If that is so, you can be sure that the equation will be a cubic equation. And the proof is here. Easily interpolate, you have of x having a linear variation. If m of x has a linear variation, then the curvature, which is phi of x, is m divided by the flexural rigidity Ei, is also going to vary linearly. If the curvature varies linearly, then how will the slope vary? The slope will be available on integration and you will get a quadratic equation. If the slope varies to the second order, how will the deflection vary? Again, you integrate once more, you get a cubic function. So, this is a proof why unknown displacements need to be restricted only to the joints. You do not have to worry about what is happening in, in between, and that is a basis for kinematic indeterminacy. Now, let us look at some examples. This is where we start a beam element, and that is a frame element. A frame element is different from the beam element in that it has also actual degrees of freedom. Let us take a fixed beam. The fixed beam is strangely something that is statically indeterminate, but is kinematically determinate because we are only interested in n displacements, joint displacements in kinematic indeterminacy. So, n k is 0. And let us take a continuous beam. You have a rotation at every joint except the fixed end. So, you have three rotations and you have one translation at the cantilever overhang end. So, your kinematic indeterminacy for that problem is four, three rotations and one translation. And let us take a fixed fixed beam which is non prismatic. So, at the joint, you have one unknown translation and one unknown rotation. So, NK is two. So, in this manner, for beams, you can easily do find out the degree of kinematic indeterminacy with and without sway. Now, let us look at a frame. That is a portal frame. 
at the fixed base you don't have any translation or any rotation so you have only three movements possible at every joint on top two translations and one rotation so that makes it six this is if you consider actual deformations now one common assumption we make in frames is that actual deformations are negligible it's actually uh, true actual deformations are not negligible only in trusses in frames and beams they are considered negligible if we make that assumption can you tell me how much nk will reduce nk is 6 right now you have four translations and two rotations if we now make an assumption that all the actual members are actually rigid they don't change in length how much will be nk okay well we'll we'll find out how to do this it's very easy you have three members so you've got three conditions so their lengths don't change so to find the reduction all you have to do is invoke a little formula the reduction in the sway degrees of freedom is exactly equal to the number of actually rigid members between the joints so you've got three members there three conditions which control your sway and so out of the four uh, and the obvious degree of freedom choose is a sway you can choose it either on the left or on the right because that beam is going to translate the same on at both ends the two columns will not change in length so you can eliminate those degrees of freedom and this is a huge simplification we reduce from six degrees of freedom to three degrees of freedom if you take a pitched portal frame like this you find that you have nine degrees of freedom if you include actual deformation if you consider actual rigidity how much will that nine reduce to so there are forms and so it reduces to five very simple let's take a huge multi-storied frame and let's try to compare static versus kinematic indeterminacy tell me what's the degree of static indeterminacy of this frame well every box will give you an indeterminacy of three and the uh, fixity at the base will give you the same image so how many boxes do you have you have 12 boxes 12 into 3 that gives you 36 36 is your degree of static indeterminacy what about kinematic including actual deformations every joint other than the fixed base will have three degrees of freedom you have 16 joints 16 into 3 48 so clearly if it's a choice between whether to use force method or displacement method you would go in for the method if you had to do it manually because you have less number of equations to solve now let's invoke this uh, idealization of actual rigidity if we invoke actual rigidity that is we ignore actual deformations then you find that every joint you have a rotation and at every floor you have only one translation and so you'll find that the degree of kinematic indeterminacy now reduces to 20 that's a huge reduction and here you'll find that the stiffness methods the displacement methods will score over the force methods the next topic is some idea about flexural stiffness okay look at this simple example of a prismatic beam subject to an end moment okay if i apply the end moment and the far end is either hinged or on a roller support it's going to deflect like that now if the beam is flexible that rotation theta naught will be more if it's stiff it will be less there's obviously a relationship between m naught and theta naught uh, can you tell me that relationship you can apply any of the methods say conjugate beam method and draw the curvature diagram it's a it's a linear diagram and you can prove the bending moment diagram will be linear you can prove that m naught is 3 ei by l into theta naught just imagine 
if that span of the beam is low, then it means the beam is more stiff and more difficult to rotate. If the span is large, it's easier to rotate. So theta naught will increase. Similarly, if EI, which is the flexural rigidity, I for example will increase with the depth of the member. Flexural rigidity and EI by L into some constant, in this case 3, is a measure of the flexural stiffness of this beam. Okay. Now we'll take the same beam and we will fix the end A. Okay, so that the slope there is zero now. Compared to the previous beam, will this beam be stiffer? Obviously, yes, it will be stiffer. Can you tell me the value of the stiffness? M naught is equal to Okay, so you can easily do this. Uh, it's not difficult. What do you have to do to the previous beam to get this beam? Any suggestions? Let me draw this on the board. You have to do something like that. The idea is to eliminate the slope theta naught by 2 which you got in the first beam and make it 0. So the only way to do it is you actually apply uh, a rotation at the left end and obviously you know the relationship between that rotation that should be 3 i by L times that theta naught by 2. Then you can work it out, you can solve it very easily and you will find that you will get a moment there which is half of the moment m naught and uh, the stiffness is now 4 ei by l theta naught so these are easy to remember simply supported beam 3 ei by l propped cantilever with the far end fixed it becomes 4 ei by l it's stiffer so it's very easy to remember these numbers 3 and 4 and the point of contraflexure will be at one third span location as shown in this picture Right, now there is another way to look at this. Uh, Let us take the kinematically determinate beam. The kinematically determinate beam is a fixed fixed beam. Okay, just like a statically determinate beam is one in which uh, you know the force response. Here you know the displacement response. There is no displacement. This is kinematically determinate. Now I want to use the displacement method to get the same picture which we got in case B. How do you do that? Here you allow the supported B to somehow undergo a rotational slip like this, theta naught. Then draw the reflected shape. The reflected shape will look like this. Okay. So what is the difference between the shape we drew in part B and the shape we have now drawn? Actually there is no difference in, in the curve. It's only a matter of interpretation. In the first picture, we had a propped cantilever in which we applied an external moment M0 and we got that deflected shape and we got those, uh, the, the rotational still get the same deflected shape. You still get the same stiffness measure and that's very important to understand. That's 4 EI by L. Okay. Now let's look at one more picture. Okay. Last one. Here we have what is called a guided fixed support at the left end. Okay, so here you are preventing the rotation, the slope at A must be 0, but you are allowing free translation. It can move up and down. And now you are applying M0 at the right end. Tell me, is this going to be stiffer than case B and case A or will it be more flexible? What is your feeling? Now how do you find out? So there is one way to understand that picture.
Now, imagine you have this length of the beam and you apply a symmetric loading like this on both sides, the deflected shape is going to be like this. Agreed? And this beam is subject to constant bending moment n. Agreed? And the span of the beam is 2L. The picture you saw there was when you bisect the beam. And then you'll find that you have an equivalent guided roller support. Now, if you use conjugate beam method, you can easily work out the stiffness and you'll find that you have a function moment there and the stiffness is i by l. And not only that, you can prove the deflection at the middle here or at the end a here is. So these three pictures are very important for you to remember and very easy for you to derive because they are going to help us simplify many problems as we'll see as we move on. So let's compare these three cases. Okay, you have the first case of the stiff, the most stiff element where you have the extreme far end also fixed, you'll find the stiffness is 4 Ei by L. You can of course model everything as a rotational spring, so we're talking of the rotational spring stiffness. Now, if you release the fixity at the other end, you have a simply supported beam or a, so then you'll find the stiffness now reduces to 3 Ei by L. And if you have a guided fixed support, it reduces to Ei by L. So you've got the slopes of those three lines. Remember these three simple numbers, by L, 3 Ei by L, 4 Ei by L. That's all you need to know and you can solve many problems. Now, that last case is also the case of a cantilever. If you have a cantilever fixed at one end and you apply a moment at the other end, you will get the same deflected shape, the same curvature and the stiffness is 